Welcome to the Environment, Climate Change and Land Reform Committee's 13th meeting of 2020. For the first item today, the committee will decide whether to take items 5, 6 and 7 and all future consideration of its approach, evidence and reports on the UK Environment Bill, LCM, COVID-19 and Green Recovery, Re Regional Marine Planning and the Scottish Government Budget 2021-2022 in private at all future meetings. If members are not content, can they please indicate by putting an N in the chat box now? Not seeing any dissent, so thank you very much, colleagues. I'll confirm that the committee agrees to that plan. Our second item today is an evidence session with the Cabinet Secretary for uh, the Environment, Climate Change, Land Reform on the UK Environment Bill and Legislative Consent Memorandum. And I welcome the Cabinet Secretary and her officials, Don McGilvery, Deputy Director of Environmental Quality and Circular Economy, Ilsa Heine, the Solicitor for the Director of Legal Services, and Charles Stuart Roper, Environmental Strategy and Governance Unit. Good morning to you all. Good morning, Cabinet Secretary. So um the committee are obviously I think I think when we look at this bill, there there is there is one thing that, that jumps out to us from a parliamentary scrutiny point of view, and that is that there is not a role for this committee in scrutinising um any aspect of the of what comes forward in the environmental bill from the UK government. Um, and we won't see any um, detail of the SIs that, that, that come before us. And all the decisions around this are going to be made at government level. And obviously, Cabinet Secretary, you've got a role in deciding whether or not you accept um, everything in the UK Environment Bill. But I just want to, to know your, your, your feelings on, on that aspect of things. Well, I do understand um, the committee's um, desire to have uh, visibility of, for example, UK statutory instruments that do affect evolved areas. Um, there was a protocol with the Parliament that uh, provided for notification uh, in areas that related to EU law, and we've obviously spent quite some considerable time analysing that uh, process. Um, uh, that has, of course, now lapsed. But uh, there is a, a new protocol under negotiation between Scottish Government and parliamentary authorities, so we're, we're, we're actively looking at how we can um, uh, consider uh, and make sure that uh, the Parliament does have uh, um, some uh, proper uh, ability to, to scrutinise what is happening uh, in respect of uh, what is, of course, a UK bill, um, which does create issues for all of us. There is no doubt about that. I mean, talk about those issues from your perspective as the Cabinet Secretary for the Environment in, in Scotland. I mean, how comfortable are you with the arrangements from, from the point of view of your oversight or your, your inclusion in uh, things that will affect us here in Scotland with regard to the environment? Well, from a purely government point of view, um, you know, we feel that we've gotten the parts of this bill that do uh, impact on us, um, that we have gotten them into a reasonably good place. Um, but that's purely speaking from a government perspective, and I do appreciate that Parliament's perspective is obviously going to be slightly different in, uh, in, in respect of that. Um, uh, we have obviously worked quite hard, and and committee needs to remember that this is a, a, a kind of second version of the bill. Um, the the, um, the the original version lapsed uh, um, with the general election in December, and we'll, uh, what's being brought forward now is a is a slightly different uh, um, uh, version uh, of the bill. Um, so what we're looking at is something uh, that uh, uh, we've had to reconsider in some cases, um, and. And, um, and and think about the the reality uh, of what we are confronting. So there are some uh, uh, you know situations where we do expect the UK government to seek the consent of Scottish ministers where they do uh, plan to include devolved provision in a UKSI. 
Um, and uh, uh, as I've indicated, ministers do agree that Parliament does need to have Scottish Parliament does need to have uh, a role uh, in that. Um, as I indicated earlier, we are discussing a new protocol uh, for that scrutiny, um, and uh, I understand, although I'm not personally involved, I understand that there are uh, the discussions are close to a successful uh, conclusion. Um, the intention is that the protocol would apply to all instruments made by UK ministers which legislate in devolved areas, and I think that was in the the, the, the letter that we had. Um, uh, uh, originally um, sent uh, to you, um, and uh, uh, you know, I I think that we are um, in as best a place as we can be in respect of of uh, of this bill. Thank you. I'm going to bring in Stuart Stevenson. Uh, thank you, uh, convener. I wonder, Cabinet Secretary, if we should not uh, also have a concern about uh, the, the processes that secondary legislation undergoes at Westminster. Um, my understanding, and I'm definitely content to be corrected on this, is that unlike in the Scottish Parliament, where a piece of secondary legislation will be referred to the relevant subject committee, um, no such similar process applies at Westminster, whereby the Standing Committee uh, that covers the subject area would automatically see an SI and have to uh, provide a view on it. Uh, they, 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 they seem to have a new uh, subsidiary uh, committee uh, that deals with uh, secondary legislation, but I'm not quite sure that its brief uh, extends to covering the policy it's like our own DPLR is simply about the construction and legal validity of the committee. So is there an additional concern we should have that Scottish laws can be changed by Westminster ministers and then not scrutinised even at Westminster to the degree that it would be if it was in Scotland? Well I can First, to not being an expert on the current House of Commons um, processes, my experience, um, uh, my six years there are now um, uh, quite a long time ago, and I think the parliamentary processes at Westminster have changed considerably um, since uh, then. And you know, regrettably, um, uh, I have no control over the Westminster procedures. Um, I would wish that they were. Uh, more aligned with what we um, are doing and have done in the Scottish Parliament, um, but I, I can't change that. What, what all I can do is to ensure that, at least as far as um, both the Scottish Government are concerned and the Scottish Parliament are concerned, that that we are uh, looking carefully um, at all of this and that it is all done within the um, uh, uh, appropriate um, uh, way and. You know the 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 working on the bill that has taken place so far has has been on the basis of devolved competence being um, uh, respected and acknowledged and recognised. Right, we'll now move on to uh, Mark Ruskell has a question on this particular issue. Yeah, thanks, convener. Um, morning, cabinet secretary. I wanted to ask you about um, the instruments that are under devolved competence. Whether a joint parliamentary procedure would be far more appropriate. So, a procedure where the SIs would be laid in the Scottish Parliament or, or the Welsh Parliament and the UK Parliament at the same time. Well, there are in um, uh, some areas uh, of the work that I do, um, there are actually discussions about doing that. Um, uh, um, uh, it, it's, it's not uh, generally uh, 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 kind of provided for in this legislation, but that's not to say um, that it doesn't happen, um, and it wouldn't. It doesn't not to say it wouldn't happen either, um, but I have to go back to saying that I can't actually control Westminster procedure. 
um, uh, any more indeed than I can control Welsh um, procedure. Um, where we are uh, thinking about doing it, it's, it's by um, a, a joint agreement across uh, across administrations, um, and that's really the only basis on which um, I think we could reasonably proceed. And that might be more or less uh, appropriate, depending on the SI. The, 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 there perhaps wouldn't be the necessity to have every SI treated like that, but there may in fact be uh, um, a usefulness to have some SIs treated like that. And I can say that that is the case in the particular issue that that I'm uh, um, that that is precisely why it's felt to be um, uh, appropriate. So that that conversation is a conversation that's already live, but it's in respect of individual SIs rather than a blanket uh, process. Mark, are you uh, content for us to move on? I was just going to come back with what just follow up to that. Okay, carry on. Uh, just following on from that, I'm just wondering what the nature of these SIs would be then. I mean, you're saying, Council Secretary, there's been discussions and perhaps around individual SIs. What, what kind of subject areas uh, would these SIs cover where a joint procedure would be more well, appropriate? Well, it's not a joint procedure. It's an aligned uh, 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 timeline. And I think that's perhaps what you're really thinking about rather than a joint procedure. It's choosing each of the administrations choose uh, um, SIs on the same uh, um, uh, timeline. It's something that we are discussing uh, with the ETS uh, um, uh, process specifically. Um, uh, so the, the point I'm making is that there is no um, resistance to us doing that. Um, it just may not be something that necessarily necessitates an absolutely blanket process for every single SI um, uh, that emerges. And, it, and you know, uh, um, you know, it, it, it isn't all it isn't easy just to snap your fingers and have four administrations all doing things on the same basis at the same time. Um, that there has to be, uh, I think, um, thought given as to when it is appropriate, when it is necessary, when it's needed um, and, and how in practical terms it can be done. Okay, thank you. We're going to move on to talking about the issues around common frameworks, and Finlay Carson would like to come in. Thank you, Cabinet Secretary. Um, yeah, I've got a series of questions on on common frameworks. Uh, given the significant challenges for the part of the legislative process, uh, and we've already heard that, can you, can you give us? Um, some further information about the common frameworks relating to the policies included in this bill, uh, particularly around the content, the format, and the, the time scales, please. Well, I mean, there are no common frameworks in existence yet. Um, uh, common frameworks um, are being discussed um, uh, across a number of areas, um, and uh, um, the, I guess. In, in reality, the closest we're to one is the ETS that I referred to, which is kind of outside this particular um, uh, uh, scope. But that's probably the one uh, that we are closest to achieving. Um, uh, but we're not there yet with that um, either. So um, uh, uh, there are no uh, uh, there are no common frameworks um, in in existence yet. Um, our, uh, I mean, absolute bottom line is that common frameworks have got to be um, agreed commonly, not simply be um, imposed uh, by one administration with the expectation that all administrations will simply sign up. That is not a common framework. So the common frameworks would be where one um, uh, might, uh, uh, where one might agree. So. Um, uh, at the moment, the development of the common frameworks that may come into existence um, uh, uh, remain in accordance with the 2017 principles that were agreed um, back then um, at the Joint Ministerial Council. Um, and uh, obviously, they have to respect devolution settlements, democratic 
accountability of the devolved legislatures um, and uh, the absolute fundamental things that they actually be agreed by all um, uh, uh, by all uh, administrations. Thank you. Can you tell us if you have any particular uh, in these common frameworks? What would you uh, like to see included? Um, and I also reference the, 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 the UK government statement about level playing fields, uh, particularly in relation to environmental standards. Can you provide any further information on the statement that LC, the, the LCM uh, could move away from these level playing field commitments, uh, and, and what are the implications for that uh, in the frameworks uh, going forward between the different administrations in the UK? Um, do you think that? Uh, does it suggest that the common frameworks might be less likely now than that? I, I missed I the end of I, that. Did you have ever been cabinet secretary? Would you like Finley to maybe go over um, that again? Well, well, I, the the I mean, it, common frameworks we've all agreed um, are an appropriate way to proceed in some areas. And that would, uh, where where the most effective way of uh, of setting up a regulatory regime is to do it across the whole of the UK, then uh, we're not um, uh, resistant to that. Um, but obviously, we've also got a, a fundamental principle uh, in Scotland of um, uh, of wanting to keep pace with uh, you. So developing common frameworks in those circumstances. Um, what we what we don't and won't agree to is common frameworks that then tie the hands uh, of, uh, of in our respect our devolved um, uh, responsibility and ability to do things uh, in our own way and that's that you know that's the basis on which they would have to be agreed you can't you know they can't become uh, a straitjacket for uh, for devolution I'm not entirely certain what 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 it is that Finley Carson is is wanting to get at here. I mean, there are obvious, more generalised concerns about um, uh, environmental uh, standards and others um, uh, when we uh, when we leave the EU, and some of those concerns have been reignited in the last couple of weeks. So, you know, we are we are very concerned um, about keeping pace with the EU standards. So, we couldn't allow common frameworks to become a handcuff that prevents that happening. The, the LCM refers to a common framework relating to how the UK Office of Environmental Protection would work alongside the, the, Scottish, uh, the Scottish equivalent when we, we find out about that. The committee wasn't aware of a common framework in that policy area. Can you but, provide further information, uh, particularly well, around the contents and the time? As I said at the start, there aren't there aren't any actual common frameworks that have been formally set up yet. There are some discussions around some areas where where um, traditionally there has been uh, cross UK um, uh, cooperation. Um, the the OEP um, that is being proposed to be uh, set up by this legislation. Um, uh, we're not uh, uh, we're not looking at common frameworks. I mean that that's in the capacity of governance bodies, and we don't talk about common frameworks in terms of governance bodies, um, and none are planned. That doesn't mean to say that the different governance arrangements in each administration will not, you know, uh, talk to each other um, uh, and develop their own working arrangements. But that's not. I mean, after all, um, uh, the OEP is meant to be. Um, Independent, um, so uh, um, it, it will no doubt um, there will be conversations uh, between people, but that's not a common framework, and that's not a joint government arrangement. Um, um, and I would remind people that, in a sense, SEPA does that kind of thing already, um, uh, both at a UK level and at a European level. So that's not an unusual um, position to be in. But it would be wrong to call that a common framework. That's not what that is. But, but the LCM refers to a common framework. Um, I, I suppose sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm looking. Sorry, I'll, I'll start again. The LCM oh. refers to a common framework. Um, so if you're suggesting it may not be a common framework, would you propose that the 
the OEP works alongside the Scottish uh, equivalent? Well, I'm sure they will talk to each other. Um, but the Scottish equivalent, you know, um, I think I indicated um, when we first spoke about this, uh, uh, you know, is, 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 you know, when, you know, and I, and I have to be careful here because I don't want to get into too much detail about the Scottish equivalent. Um, uh, um, the proposals for that will be in uh, the, the continuity bill. So, um, you know, we're, we're in, um, uh, uh, you know, we're, we're not talking about a common framework for these governance bodies. I think that's a misunderstanding of what common frameworks are actually they're about regulatory regimes. Um, uh, they're not about common framework of governance. I'd like to bring in Claudia Beamish on this issue. Claudia. Thank you very much, convener, and good morning, Cabinet Secretary, and to your officials. Um, could I just, uh, I, I was reflecting on the, the CEPA um, submission to our committee about the um, environmental governance and also principles. And in terms of the um, Office of Environmental Protection, CEPA is actually says um, uh, about clarifying this issue in relation to themselves and the Office of Environmental Protection. I quote, CEPA's understanding is that the matter under the Scotland Act 2000, and, sorry, um, 1998, and that the EOP has no jurisdiction over devolved legislative provisions. The vast majority of what CEPA regulates is therefore excluded from the scrutiny of the OEP. Would you agree with that, Cabinet Secretary? And do you have any further comments on that? Um, yes, I do agree with it. Um, I, I don't really um, have any other comments um, uh, on 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 that. I mean, CEPA is the the the, the CEPA is a is an organisation which has been um, set up by statute in Scotland um, uh, by the Scottish Parliament. It works to the, 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 the you know, to Scottish legislation. The vast majority of what it does um, uh, means that their responsibility to, is, is to that legislation. There are a handful of things where um, there is what's called a kind of executive devolution, where, you know, we're, you know they're doing one or two things um, uh, uh, on behalf of uh, 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 Westminster, but that's a you know, in a slightly different uh, um, in, a, in a slightly different area, and there are very few instances of that. So, um, from CEPA's perspective, um, uh, they I, uh, um, I they wouldn't expect really to have uh, much contact, if any at all, with the OEP, and I would expect that to be the same for uh, virtually everything that that happens in Scotland. It's the Scottish environmental governance arrangements which will be relevant for not just SEPA uh, but for other agencies and for activity in Scotland. Right, um, thank you Cabinet Secretary, that's some um, uh, helpful clarification um, which I was hoping for. <laughs> um, could, could I just also ask you um, uh, about the, in, in relation to governance, about the, the four EU environmental principles which um, were we, we enshrined in the previous um, continuity bill in Scotland, and uh, um, I have concerns, as do others on the committee and far more widely, such as Environment Link in their submission, about um, making sure that those are in legislation, but they may well not be, as I understand it, in the UK Environment Bill. So I'm wondering um, what your thoughts are on on those environmental principles and how we can ensure that we continue to work with them. Thank you. Well, I think I've made my position on a number of different uh, occasions very clear um, that what we want to do in Scotland is uh, is continue uh, to make sure that those environmental principles are what guide us um, to keep pace uh, um, with the developments in the EU. To ensure that Scotland is where at all possible, um, uh, reaching the best possible standards, um, and that is not something that there is any intention to move away from, um, and we will continue to do that for obvious reasons. I can't control uh, what uh, the government at Westminster chooses to 
legislate for um, itself. But uh, for my part, this part of the United Kingdom will continue to comply uh, um, and abide by those principles uh, and, and comply with uh, what follows for, through from them. Thank you very much, Cabinet Secretary. Would you agree that that would um, that the sort of the, the follow on from that would be that um, we should be looking, if it's not there in the UK um, legislation, to ensure that we enshrine that again in the in the future um, Scottish Government continuity bill? Well, I, I think it's I think it's indirectly referred to in the UK bill. I think they're going to put it in guidance rather than uh, um, than legislation and. Um, I, uh, I the, we're waiting the introduction of the continuity bill, and I don't really want to be uh, drawn um, uh, too far on on that. They they will be in the continuity bill, um, uh, but for obvious reasons, I can't I can't discuss in detail um, aspects of the bill of the continuity bill. Right. Uh, thank you, Cabinet Secretary. We look forward to to seeing that then and. Um, but I, I think I'll, I'll pass back to the convener on that note. Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to bring in Stuart Stevenson. Uh, thank you, convener. I just wanted to ask a very simple little question. Uh, <laughs> cabinet is it is it your view that the common framework, insofar as it uh, sets standards, is merely a floor to what we can do? In Scotland, in other words, we can't fall below the standards set there, but it creates no ceiling in the standards to which we might take ourselves. And that's it, Kim. Um, the common frameworks are about cooperation. I mean, I I I see them um, as being important when uh, it continues to be relevant that we think about things in a. Um, in a UK on a UK wide basis, the the areas where, um, notwithstanding um, uh, our devolved competence, that there is some merit in in having a regime that operates in a similar fashion um, a, across the whole of the UK. Um, so um, I, I, that's how I see common frameworks. So it's it, it it is perhaps not even in the in in the way that Stuart Stevenson um, is describing it. it. It is about a decision. That, that a regulatory framework in a particular circumstance is uh, is best applied in similar fashion across the board. It doesn't tie our hands in uh, uh, in going in in going um, uh, further in policy terms. Nothing can, um, and 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 I think that would be important to say. But if we came to an agreement on a common framework, it would be by agreement only. And that's the, the the real issue about common frameworks that they can only uh, come into being if all of the administrations um, are in agreement with them um, and, uh, uh, and and prepared to uh, um, uh, continue on that basis. Right. Thank you. We we'll may move on to a supplementary question on this issue. Uh, from Mark Ruskell. Yeah, thanks. Um, just yeah, thanks. Get back on the issue of the OEP uh, cabinet secretary and whether we've got absolute clarity on the role of the OEP. So, if I could use the example of an oil spill, we've obviously of got what? an oil spill. All right. In waters, which would obviously be a major environmental disaster. In, in that situation. You've got reserved responsibilities in relation to the Merchant Shipping Act 95, so you might expect the OEP to lead on that. But you've obviously got devolved responsibilities there as well. Is there clarity as to what role the OEP would would play in Scotland with an environmental disaster such as an oil spill? Where is the crossover with SEPA and other regulatory? Well, I would expect. Um, there to be uh, considerable cooperation and joint working if we were in uh, circumstances such as that. Um, the OEP will have no remit over the competence of the Scottish Parliament, and it will have no remit over the actions of Scottish ministers. Um, where there is 
uh, an issue where devolved and reserved uh, uh, responsibilities interact, then we do expect coordination and cooperation uh, between uh, the OEP and our future Scottish environmental governance body. Um, of, of course, we do. But I, um, I'm not sure whether or not the 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 actions that are taken to deal with that, as opposed to the way the OEP might then consider whether or not they were appropriate, are are the OEP is not the body that's going to do the actual dealing with the oil spill. That will be both governments, depending on their uh, responsibilities. Okay. So, so the, the consequences of an oil spill in terms of corporate governance or the adequacy of the cleanup response, that would be in the role of the OEP then. But the immediate aftermath of the oil spill and the coordination of efforts on the ground would be SEPA. Well, the, well yes, of, of course, SEPA, SEPA will have all the existing responsibility that it, that it does have. Um, SEPA is not an equivalent to the OEP. It's the Environment Agency in England that is the equivalent to uh, uh, to SEPA, not the OEP. The OEP is the UK government's uh, answer to the governance gap when we remove, you know, uh, uh, the the, um, the EU's overarching uh, uh, responsibility. But not even at EU level did they step in and actually do do the work themselves. They, I think there's a danger of confusing what the roles are here. So the Office for Environmental Protection, despite the fact that the words environmental protection are in the name, is is the Office for Environmental Protection doesn't replace the Environment Agency, um, uh, much less become the equivalent of SEPA. So I think we need to just be very clear here about the difference between uh, these uh, um, uh, um, the, these organisations. So, as with anybody that we would set up here, they will make recommendations, but they're not the body that actually does the job on the ground. Hmm. But if there was a concern about compliance, if there was a concern about the adequacy of the response, and there was an environmental complaint that was made, that would go to the OEP then? Well, it depends on what the complaint was about. If it's about a reserved issue, it could go to the OEP. If it was about a devolved our um, uh, environmental uh, government's arrangement, but you know, in those circumstances where you have an issue which effectively um, uh, uh, brings both devolved and reserved issues together, you would expect both the governance bodies to work together as well. Right. Okay. Thank you. No. But that's joint uh, working. Not the OEP running things, if you see what I mean. There's that that would be a, a kind of misunderstanding of what it would be, because the OEP wouldn't have a remit over any of the devolved issues that were being complained about. Yeah, we have a remit over. Okay, can I ask about the the SI process? Um, because during the the, the No Deal, uh, the scrutiny of the No Deal SIs that we've been dealing with. Um, you know, in some cases, we were given less than 28 days as a panel committee uh, to actually scrutinise those. I mean, you're a former committee convener. Do you, do you think it's fair that the Scottish Parliament effectively um, shares its powers with government over these legislative, legislative instruments that are going to be brought forward? Um, and what, what opportunities do you, do you see our committee having in terms of scrutinising these SIs? Um, before they actually get consented, because we're really just considering the actual event. Well, I mean, I could give you a very long list of things I don't think are fair in the current uh, um, circumstances, and it probably wouldn't uh, um, get us anywhere. As I said earlier, there is um, uh, um, kind of detailed joint discussions going on about how we manage this, um, and that in its specifics will be a question for. Um, for the protocol, um, uh, you know, there may be um, some put on my previous convener's hat. Um, God forbid that I should step on the current convener's toes in this regard, but there might be some 
um, advantage in considering whether or not there is any proactive way to begin to explore an issue before an SI begins to appear. And I just, you know, there there, there are there are perhaps ways to to to, to think about that. Um, but the truth is that um, we are in the process of uh, attempting to set up um, a, a protocol that will allow um, the Scottish parliamentary process uh, um, scrutiny of the SIs. Um, I do agree that what happened um, with the ones relating to No Deal, it became quite um, frantic, I think, at a certain point, um, and that's not particularly helpful. But I'm hoping that that wouldn't necessarily be the case in 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 this regard. I'm, I'm, I'm very much there isn't going to be um, that uh, um, uh, that level of or that slight air of panic that that began to began to emerge. Um, I mean, I I'm, I'm happy to ask if any of the officials are directly involved in the discussions about the protocol, whether or not they want to add anything specifically. Um, to uh, uh, to that, I'm not quite sure uh, how appropriate that is. So, um, if anybody wishes to uh, come in um, from my official side, um, then uh, that would be fine. Um, but um, at the moment, as I as I indicated, there are detailed discussions ongoing, um, and uh, while they haven't been finalised, they're relatively close to a conclusion as far as I understand. I don't know if any of the officials um, would like to come in, just bring in John McGilvery. Um, Chaps, like I'm, I'm only going to come in to say I've, I've got nothing to add to what you've already said. Uh, the protocol that's being um, discussed between our parliamentary liaison officials and the parliamentary officials uh, goes well beyond this bill and even this portfolio. Um, so it's 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 the officials that deal with kind of cross government parliamentary liaison, li, uh, relations rather that are are leading on that. So it, it's just to say I have nothing further to add to what the council has said. I guess if I could just jump in, I guess the issue that we have is that the actual content of an SI is something that obviously cabinet secretary you'll see and you'll be making decisions on that the content of that will never come in front of the uh, us in the committee to to even look at even the text of it I, I, it, it, um you know it is just one of those one of those things that um i mean that the, there will be there will be obvious potential SIs arising I mean, we we know from primary legislation that there is always a, a, a you know, often a trigger for the for the SI that's quite specific, um, uh, so that uh, one can ascertain often that there will be an SI in a particular area, a very specific area, and sometimes it is an area in which a committee may have already taken some evidence um, uh, throughout the, the the course of previous. Uh, legislative process. I think while I'm 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 just kind of trying to think here about some of the ways in which committees and clearly it would be all committees um, uh, um, can can get a sort of head start on um, some of the work that is required. And SIs often require consultations as well. So um, I, I, I think. Perhaps the, the 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 problem is we're 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 using the no deal scenario as 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 if it was a template for the way this is going to proceed, and I'm not sure that that is necessarily going to be the case. Um, uh, and and clearly there is um, a concern to ensure that there is a proper process um, uh, for Scottish Parliament um, uh, purposes. Um, to dealing with SIs that arise in this way. Okay, thank you. We're going to move on to talking about uh, producer responsibility and resource efficiency, and I'm going to come back to Finlay Carson. Uh, thank you. Can I ask why the, the Scottish Government uh, supports sharing its power with the UK Government in relation to producer res responsibility and resource efficiency? Rather than agreeing policy alignment and parallel legislation across the four administrations in the UK. 
Well, um, we've 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 had schemes operating on a UK-wide basis, um, uh, but um, uh, and 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 we have been doing that. That's something that we have. Um, uh, 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 long uh, been doing, uh, but we believe that this can be achieved without compromising any devolved uh, competence. Um, uh, and uh, um, you know, the the producer responsibility um, uh, um, is um, uh, is is something which is important to quite a lot of the work that we do in terms of circular economy. So we would always want to ensure that we still had the capacity, if 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 we deemed it necessary, to be able to act in our in our own regard. Um, uh, but um, uh, you know, we we I'm not quite sure what Fiddley Carson would expect me to say in these circumstances. I mean, I'm 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 you know the the, the agreements that we've reached so far have been by consent. Um, uh, the provisions allow that to continue, but they also allow for separate Scottish schemes to be established. Um, uh, and, and I think that that's absolutely right. So we can continue to do things by consent when that seems appropriate. But when uh, when we feel uh, that uh, 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 differentiation is needed, we are not um, uh, in any way inhibited from doing that. Now, I think that's right. I mean, I, I don't see. Why we should be in the position of compromising um, devolved competence, notwithstanding that any particular point in time there may actually be um, a good reason um, to to have agreed schemes in particular areas, for example, producer responsibility. Um, I've told the committee uh, in the in the past in relation to producer responsibility and resource efficiency. That the Scottish Government uh, has committed to keeping pace with EU directives and regulations as, as far as possible. Um, when do you foresee that, when uh, as far as possible, might be ruled out? I'm sorry. As far as possible is as where in 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 reality it is achievable. I mean, it isn't a case of ruling it out. I mean that there may be. Uh, 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 some occasions where it might simply not be um, uh, achievable, but in in my view, um, I'm not in the business of trying to compile a long list of times or on which it's not going to happen. I appro I'm approaching this on the basis that the default position is it it will happen. We will keep pace. Okay, uh, so, so later what would happen if a UK wide scheme. Set up using powers in this bill, then the UK decides uh, changes uh, which the Scottish government are not willing to accept. Um, is there a point you would look at um, take coming out of that scheme, and how difficult would it be um, to disentangle um, the, the, the schemes and set up a Scottish one? Right. I mean, with the greatest of respects, we're already doing uh, some of that joint uh, um, scheme working. We have been doing it. It hasn't caused any difficulties. Um, there are, um, uh, uh, you know, there, there, there is always the possibility that we will uh, consider that there is a, a better way to proceed, and we will choose to do that. But I don't really think it's particularly helpful for us to list hypothetical situations where that might be the case. I mean, we're, you know, we're not starting from nothing here. We're starting from a situation where there has already been um, uh, agreed working, um, and at the moment, um, uh, we're not uh, thinking in those particular circumstances um, that that long-established uh, uh, agreement uh, um, uh, should should cease. It's, it's operating effectively. Um, uh, if there is a question in future on on anything, then we will well whoever is in whoever is the government in future and you know, parliamentary Scottish Parliament authorities in future will make will make these will make these decisions at the appropriate time. Um, I, I suppose I'm just the, the question is the Tuesday. I'm, I'm pleased to hear that things are working and you don't foresee any issues going forward and that there's good collaboration working. So I welcome your statements on that. Okay, thank you. Um, now, 
we had a comprehensive uh, response from your cabinet secretary um, to all our questions on the bill. And uh, Mark Ruskell would like to pick on the pick up on the response around the reach UK reach regulations, um, which I think was question fifty three. Mark, can I hand over to you? And then um, also Angus Macdonald, I think, has some questions after you. Mark, over to you. Yeah, thanks. I mean, it, it actually follows on from from the last answer that you gave, Cabinet Secretary, and, it, and it's about the the safeguarding provisions that are in the UK reach. Um, so if you if you uh, were in a situation where uh, the UK government didn't agree to make regulations, and you differed from that. Uh, I see in, in your answer to 53 that you'd be able to take provisional action. Could you just explain what provisional action means? Is that a, is that a permanent uh, solution that would be put in place, or, 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 or what? Is it more discussion, a break on regulations, or, or what, what would it in, involve? Well, the word provisional um, kind of suggests not permanent. Um, uh, um, uh, you know, you, you, if, if you're using the word provisional, you're putting in um, a, a, a fix, uh, uh, perhaps while you while you consider things. Um, uh, um, I, I, um, uh, I, I, you know, that would be something that would need to be considered carefully at the time. I think that what what all we're trying to signal is um, that uh, um, these these agreements in areas of devolved responsibility, whatever they be, don't uh, uh, tie our hands in terms of making our own decisions uh, within the devolved area of competence. Okay, and can I ask about other areas where there might be disagreement going forward? Um, and I think Angus McDowell might come in on at other angles as well. But, but the European Chemicals Agency membership, I mean, that's something that I presume you really value in terms of alignment with the EU reach uh, and ensuring alignment across scientific standards and, and, and research. Absolutely. Is that, is, that, is that going to happen at UK level? And if it isn't, what are your options to ensure that we, we continue to, uh, to, be, to be working with the ECHA? Well, I can't, um, you know, I can't say what will and will not happen. Definitely, um, our view um, uh, remains very much that the best option would be for the UK to remain part of the EU Chemicals Agency and EU Reach. Um, if the UK government and, and we want membership of ECHA, but if if the UK government uh, doesn't actually go down that road, then we obviously need some functioning system to to replace it. Um, and uh, uh, the SIs, uh, in respect of that, um, were agreed to by the committee um, last year. Um, so the system is based on decisions made on a UK basis, but with consent where these relate to uh, devolved um, devolved issues. Um, uh, I think if there was a um, significant difference of opinion, then then you'd probably be looking at some form of UK-wide assessment to uh, uh, consider whatever that um, particular issue was. And there are discussions on the chemicals framework currently. It hasn't been completed. It is not a formal framework, and it's nowhere near. It's not ready for any consideration by uh, ministers. So um, the discussions are progressing, but we're not at the point of this. Um, being a framework of um, uh, in any formal sense. Okay. Can I bring in Angus McDonald? Angus. Okay, thanks, um, a convener. Um, could I just explore a wee bit the uh, uh, issue of um, a liaison and, and discussion? Um, the, the cabinet secretary mentioned that discussions are, are progressing, but. We have a submission from uh, Tom Shields, who's the former uh, or the previous chair of the Chemical Sciences Scotland uh, organisation, and, and he says in, in the submission that uh, uh, neither Chemical Sciences Scotland nor himself um, have been consulted uh, by the Scottish Government or the UK Government on uh, protected provisions 
or indeed on the common framework issue. Um, so, I mean, obviously the UK government can uh, answer for themselves, but um, I'm curious as to why um, Chemical Sciences Scotland hasn't been consulted uh, by the Scottish government. And um, in addition, was chemical the Chemical Industries Association uh, consulted, uh, which is clearly another industry body. Well, I think it's because the framework isn't at that stage yet. I, I, the, you know, we're, this is still work in progress. So, um, uh, I, as yet, um, uh, um, the, the, there isn't a framework that we can then discuss with who, you know, the, the affected um, uh, um, uh, part of industry. So, you know, we. we you know, we'll need to see what the outcome of the discussions and uh, uh, proposals are, um, and then I mean, this is not the, these frameworks aren't things that are going to be brought in very quickly in very short order. Um, uh, um, these are going to take considerable amount of time, work, and consultation. Yes, to actually produce. Um, uh, so this framework isn't at that point yet. Okay, um, and you know clearly. I think uh, time in, is fairness, in, in fairness, you know this is a UK bill, so um, uh, it is for the UK to make sure that the consultation takes place. Um, uh, and I just go back to us: we have continued to argue for alignment with the EU. Okay, that, that's fair comment, convener. Um, thank you, cabinet secretary. Okay, thank you. Right, we're going to move on to the final area of questioning around this uh, from Stuart Stevenson. Uh, thank you uh, very much, convener. Um, I, I just want to probe a little bit further uh, relationships between ministers north and south of the border, in particular where uh, a power can be exercised by either. Um, this by decision as to who will take the action uh, is going to be made by agreement and not by imposition. Uh, and and, and in, indeed, that opens up just the general question uh, of uh, core decision making rather than centralised and imposed decision making. Cabinet Secretary. I'm not sure what the question actually was. I mean, oh, I think it let me, dropped out. So, if you maybe want to go over that again, uh, right, Cabinet Secretary, I'll, I'll have another shot. There are areas where either the Scottish Minister or the UK Minister can proceed with secondary legislation. How is the decision who will do it? Well, it, I mean, the decisions will be made on a case by case basis um, on uh, uh, on which level of regulation. Um, but if it's UK government regulations, then it would be subject to consent. So, you know, it, our consent would be required. Right, and 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 therefore, is that implying that the Scottish ministers are able to withhold consent? I mean, there are some areas where there is clear co and equal decision making. One, when I was a minister, was appointments to the UK Climate Change Committee. All four jurisdictions had to agree. No question of anybody imposing views. Is that the case in this area? Well, anything that is um, subject to consent by implication, uh, you know, effectively means that consent can be withheld. Um, you know, Stuart Stevenson will know from his own previous experience that um, where that can be avoided, we, we, we attempt to avoid it. But uh, um, if, if consent is required and is not forthcoming, then uh, uh, yes, that is something that would need to be worked through. But but where consent is always the possibility, 
and the capacity for that consent to be withheld. And uh, I'm going to come back to Claudia Beamish, who has got a question on the circular economy. And I think this will be the last question on this part of the session. Claudia. Thank you, Convener. Cabinet Secretary, I just wanted to highlight um, uh, something that came in, in the main from the Environment Link submission to our committee and also touched on by um, Zero Waste Scotland submission about the circular economy and um, this isn't a criticism because I appreciate where we are, uh, obviously, of course, with the, the COVID restrictions and the challenges. But with the bill being delayed, do you see the, the arrangements in the um, or the possible ones if this becomes an act, the UK Environment Bill, um, will be um, valuable to us um, uh, or not? Um, I missed the bit about the things that might be valuable um, to us, but I don't know whether or not um, uh, um, uh, Claudia has a specific or any specific things uh, in mind. Um, we are because of the um, lack, un, you know, because of our inability to introduce the circular economy bill. I can, however, advise the committee that we are considering um, what vehicle further charges in certain things might be made under, for example, charges for single-use items. So we are actively looking for um, alternative ways to achieve some of what we were looking to achieve with uh, um, the Circular Economy Bill. Um, I, I'm not sure if that's effectively the, the kind of thing that Claudia was angling for, because I missed the bit about what she thought might actually be useful in terms of the UK Bill. No, that, that that's helpful. Um, it, it was simply that that there is obviously envir um, there are environmental um, standards um, being put into the UK bill, and um, in terms of producer responsibility, and um, of course we've now got the DRS scheme here and a whole range of uh, ways in which we're frankly you know well going going ahead. But I, I just wondered whether that um, UK arrangement, um, that UK-wide arrangement will help us in any way to take things forward? I'm not sure we're looking at it in that way, no. I don't, I don't think we're regarding you know, those more general aspects of the bill to be relevant to us. What we will, you know, we are wanting to uh, continue to take forward um, a lot of the issues that we've obviously been discussing for quite some time that have been in government um, and uh, um, uh, and as I indicated we're, we're actively looking at um, alternative ways if we can try and bring things um, forward more quickly than, than, than when we might be able to return to um, the circular economy bill um, uh, process. Um, I mean, obviously we're in a slight state of, of hiatus at the moment. Um, and, and therefore, I can't be specific at this stage about you know what that might look like, or even what rough scale might be required in order to do it. But we're not dropping any of the commitments. We're just finding uh, we're going to find different ways to achieve them. Right. Thank you, Cabinet Secretary. And we do have a quick supplementary request from Mark. Yeah. Thanks. I was just trying to get clear in in. My own minds about how we go forward with with this LCM because I guess you're asking as current secretary to approve something for Parliament to approve this, approve the government's position in advance of us knowing exactly what scrutiny arrangements will be with future SIs that are going to this Parliament. What what could be what could be provided this committee then to reassure us about that arrangement in advance of us? considering this LCM any further, in advance of Parliament considering this any further? Because you're saying there's a lot of discussion at the moment with the Parliament about how we can scrutinise going forward, how we can get a heads up on draft SIs um, before they're actually laid by, by government. But I, I'm, not, I'm not clear what that looks like at the moment. There's no further details today. So what, what can be provided ahead of our, our next opportunity to, to decide on this? Um, well, I'm not. I'm not 
important I I can give the level of detail that the um, uh, that you might that you might wish. Um, uh, all I'm aware of um, is that the protocol um, is likely to be agreed before recess, um, but that's about as far as I can say on the timing. Um, and uh, at that point, there will be. Uh, uh, well, there will then be something more um, to discuss, but I think I'm right in saying the protocol is not just about this bill, um, uh, you know, so that it's it's uh, it's a wider protocol um, that's being put in place. Okay. Great. Thank you, colleagues, um, and thank you to the cabinet secretary and her officials for uh, giving us. Um, the evidence they have this morning on the um, UK uh, bill. We are a little bit ahead of schedule, which is great because we can have a short break and actually resume back at our scheduled time for the next session on COVID-19, the Green Recovery at 10.40. So I'm going to suspend the meeting. Welcome back. Um, we are moving on to our next item in the agenda today. It's our third item and we'll welcome back the Cabinet Secretary for this evidence session on COVID-19 and the Green Recovery. The Cabinet Secretary is now joined by David Mallon, who is the Head of Policy and Implementation Unit of the Climate Change Division for the Scottish Government. Um, I'll, I'll come to members uh, as well. And I want to thank the Cabinet Secretary uh, for you know, coming to us. It was a good two months ago with the, the, the concept of the Green Recovery um, and, and giving us a Sort of outline briefing on that. Um, we appreciate that was only two months ago. We're not expecting much in the way of very specific um, uh, actions. But it, I guess this is our, our last committee meeting before our recess, and we really wanted to check in with the cabinet secretary just on how the government's thinking has progressed on on the green recovery. Um, we also, of course, in the interim period between the last time we spoke about this and today, there has been a Committee for Climate Change uh, advice, and uh, Cabinet Secretary will know that we had an informal discussion with Chris Stark from the Committee for Climate Change uh, last week, where we talked about some of the kind of like high-level ideas around how we recover from this pandemic economically, but while bearing in mind our um, ambitions with regard to. Uh, emissions reductions. I'd like to ask the Cabinet Secretary, um, I guess, the, the immediate opportunities that might be available to us. And I'm conscious of the fact on Friday, one of those immediate opportunities was announced in the form of the Energy Transition uh, Innovation Funding that's uh, been announced by the First Minister. Um, Chris Stark talked about taking some of the, the positive, maybe not the right word, given that this is a terrible situation we're in, in right now, but some of the behavioural changes that we've seen as a result of the pandemic and taking them forward, um, holding on to the good stuff as, as we move forward um, out of the pandemic and into a, a different type of economy. I wonder what the cabinet's thoughts are on that. Um, well, that, that, that's a very general question because um, one of the challenges that we have at the moment is actually understanding um, uh, um, the exact extent of some of the behaviour changes um, and uh, um, how uh, they will manifest themselves in the future. Um, so there's been a lot of discussion, uh, for example, around the transport changes. Um, and there are aspects of those transport changes that I think we would all want to see continue. The, the increased use of um, active travel, the walking, um, uh, the uh, cycling, etc. And you know, obviously, there's been um, uh, money committed to local authorities to to really, um, in 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 a very uh, quick um, and straightforward way, to try and maximise. Um, uh, that make it more accessible, uh, um, etc. Um, but equally, I mean, there is a real issue around um, the issue of public transport and the the, uh, the ability um, and desire of people to um, go back onto 
um, uh, uh, mass public transport. Um, so I think that we have to be just a little careful um, about some of the potential outcomes and the and what the behaviour change may may and I don't mean this as a pun but may drive because there will be um, uh, there will be um, even within that sector there will be um, welcome aspects uh, of, of what has happened. There may, there may be other aspects that are that are going to give us some issues. Um, and that's why right now it is actually extremely difficult in some areas to um, uh, um, to assess um, that behaviour change. Um, we will want to um, uh, build on behaviour changes that we think are are good and helpful, but there are other behaviour changes which we will want to rapidly find a way around. So. Um, you know, one of my real concerns is, and you, we will all have seen it, the um, the rapid return to single use um, items, um, and and a, a, a kind of regrettably, uh, you know, um, careless disposal. So there are some real issues there where we were on make, we were making really good headway, and we were building in some fantastic behaviour change. Which, to a greater or lesser extent, has now been pushed into reverse. So, so it isn't just as simple as saying, "How do we build on the behaviour change?" It's about ascertaining the aspects of the behaviour change um, which we will want to sustain, and those aspects that we will not want to sustain. Um, so, it's a complicated area. And of course, there, I mentioned this to Chris Stark last week, there is the danger that because we've had the last two months where they, you know, we've not been flying, there have not been as many car journeys happening, um, that we look at maybe the emissions reduction as a result of that. And when we come out of that, we, uh, Maybe think we can bank that when, in fact, actually, we're in danger of people, as you as you point out, going going into the cars more than using public transport. You know, taking advantage of uh, you know flights if they arrive back and holidays they arrive back, and that we almost go too far in the other direction. So that has to be factored in as well. We've we've not really made. The gains that some people might suggest just because we've been in lockdown. No, and and, and that's where I mean, a, a, you know, a real analysis of what's currently happening happening is really important. But it's quite hard to do when you're in the middle of the of the management of it to also trying to be analysing it. So, so to a certain extent, there are you know there there is a challenge um, for us all there, and I'm I'm guessing that every single government is struggling with exactly that same challenge. Um, I I, I, I the, the, the transport issue, because it covers so many different aspects of 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 uh, you know of our lives, is is a real struggle. I, I'm not sure people will, if they're not happy about going onto a into a, onto a train carriage or a or a or a busy bus, they're probably not going onto a busy flight either. Um, but I think that uh, uh, what will happen. Um, is that those areas of transport that are actually much more fundamental to daily life will probably there will have to be ways found around it, um, uh, um, and, and aviation is in a is in a very particular place, and, and we often speak about aviation not as if it was really about transport issues. Um, uh, transport uh, for for most of what we talk about is the day and daily. Um, commuting the 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 um, the transportation of of goods and what have you from one place to another and how best that can be managed. Um, uh, aviation is always seen as more of um more of a choice rather than a than than a necessity, which is where a lot of the focus is on and getting it down. Um, I, I have, I mean, I I I, I genuinely don't know what the answer to some of this is, and I think it's. You know, fair for us to to be honestly admitting that there are areas of of human behaviour now that we we can't be certain 
um, uh, how they will how how they will look in in six months, a year, or two years' time. Um, I think you're right in asking about the danger of just banking things and making presumptions about what that means. But in actual fact, uh, that isn't what uh, um, isn't what happens um, in the future. And I go back to my concern about people's willingness to to be uh, on mass transportation. Um, and I note in passing um, that you know I've I've heard um, car salesmen car manufacturers um, very much wanting to be back and opened up because they think there is now going to be a big pent up demand or a motor vehicle will prefer to, to drive in their own car than than to take public transport. Um, so managing that is going to be quite difficult. Finley Carson would like to come in over to you. We've heard that uh, we've heard that we need to go faster and further. That was before uh, COVID nineteen. Um, we've had a, a, a long period of lockdown, and and that in some instances will be habit forming. Are, are you planning to bring any emergency legislation or or, or new policies forward, which will? Uh, Get over some of the hurdles that we would have seen previously. So that might be uh, councils uh, recycling more. At the moment, in my constituency, we moved from uh, a fortnight nightly collection back down to one bin per per week, uh, and the councils will need to go back uh, and, and review that once we're out of lockdown and went back to normal working. So, can you foresee policies to uh, ensure that? Up to speed because they've all had to, to, you know, deal with rubbish in a different way. Well, to a certain extent, um, you know, the the arrangements that have been put in place um, during this emergency would would um, would have been put in place because of the difficulties around staffing, um, maintaining. Um, uh, proper social distancing, um, and will all have been uh, put in place on uh, what most people would anticipate is a temporary basis. Now, how long temporary becomes, of course, is something that we can't really answer yet. Um, we're in the process of of some restrictions being eased. There is a phased um, uh, um, process that we're in. So uh, one might be able to uh, uh, anticipate that at a certain point we will be able to reinstate pretty much uh, uh, what was there before, and I think that would be um, uh, um, uh, uh, something that we would we would welcome. If the early part of Finlay Carson's question um, was to be asking. Is there going to be emergency legislation to further accelerate um, uh, what might have been a pre-COVID normal? Then, at this point, I have to say that I I don't see what that legislation would be, what it what it might look like, because at the at the moment we are still in the to get um, uh, what will become. Uh, I, I guess the phrase is that we're using the new normal, and it's really that you might then begin to think that there um, there may be other uh, uh, legislative uh, requirements um, coming into play here. I mean the the I mean we have the the primary piece of legislation for us, of course, is the climate change legislation. Um, um, we don't, you know, we're not moving away from that. We're not. We're not dialing that back. Um, you know, society and the economy has taken a massive hit, which we can't ignore, and therefore we have to wrap into how we um, how we proceed. Um, but uh, I'm not clear what kind of emergency legislation Finlay Carson envisages might be required. 
I, I guess um, it was to prevent local authorities going back to the old norm when they had plans to upgrade the recycling or whatever. So, again, for in Dumfries and Galloway, we have plans for a new recycling scheme, but that's staged in 2021, 22, 23. However, is it sensible for these local authorities to go back to the old norm before then uh, up, updating their recycling uh, to what they were planned in the future? It would seem to be there would be additional costs. Um, so it, it was on that basis whether we could accelerate uh, the, the rollout of okay. the new recycling scheme and revert them to the old ones. Well, well, I suppose in that sense, until we know what the new norm is, it's difficult to, to really be positive, or you know, be specific about what that what that might be. Uh, I, I guess in more general terms, if what Finlay Carson is angling to is that there might be some areas in which we could accelerate action, then yes, I do envisage that that might be the case. That there might be um, uh, there might be areas um, of activity or the economy. Where, um, uh, where what has happened um, uh, leads us to suppose that we could actually perhaps accelerate changes that might have taken longer to go into place. Um, yes, that might that might happen, but that in a sense is a bit different to emergency legislation, which was the specific thing that, that Finlay um, uh, Carson was was asking about. Okay, thank you for that. I, I'm now going to move on to your uh, your pet. Topic um, and that peatland restoration. Um, peatland. We, we, we can see that uh, there's going to be, uh, you know, quite a change in our in our job situation where we have uh, it's some sectors where people will not be returning to work as quickly as they might do. Can you see um, the Scottish government accelerating the rollout of tree planting and peatland restoration uh, using uh, a new workforce that could be trained to deliver that uh, quicker? Well, I, I I would certainly hope so. Um, the the um, outdoor working has of course um, you know begun again. Um, the 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 potential for uh, you know increased workforce um, uh, skills and training in a number of outdoor areas um, is 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 great. I would always. Um, argue for uh, increased resource in these areas, um, but I don't want to, us to forget what an enormous um, uh, the, uh, the budget brought us with that, that commitment to quarter of a million, uh, quarter of a billion over over ten years, which generates the confidence in an industry that there is a point in. Um, training. There is a point in uh, uh, in increasing employee numbers. There is a point in all of it because you know it's going to be sustained and consistent. So it's that sustained, consistent funding I think is the key. Um, and the quarter of a billion that we managed to get for peatland restoration. Um, uh, I don't want us just to slide past that um, uh, and and forget what an enormous. Um, commitment that was. Um, I'm absolutely certain that my colleague Fergus Ewing um, would want to argue as well for um, for increased funding for tree planting. Um, it, you know, we've always got to make sure that we do have the capacity to carry. It goes back to the bit that Finlay Carson was talking about: the capacity to to grow um, uh, um, some aspects of the rural economy. And indeed, I've been consistently saying it over the last two, three months that it is incredibly important because this, these are these are some parts of the economy which we can actually um, grow and uh, uh, build on. And therefore, it's very, very important, particularly for those areas where um, jobs may be um, more difficult to get um, and are in shorter supply. Finlay, can I bring in Stuart Stevenson at this point? Seems a good point to, to cross over to Stuart's questions about transition. Uh, thank you, convener. Um, I had an excellent meeting with the Industrial Decarbonisation Research and Innovation Centre uh, on Friday, uh, which focused on capitalising on some of the vacuums in 
uh, behaviours uh, in our population that uh, have been brought in by the COVID crisis, less travel being uh, the most obvious one that we've been talking about, uh, but also, of course, the dramatic reduction in the uh, uh, price of uh, crude uh, oil is having an effect on the North East of Scotland in particular as well, and is likely to lead to uh, a, a, a a change in employment patterns. Uh, the 62 million the government has just brought forward that will, uh, to some extent, help the transition. But in particular, in uh, your brief, Cabinet Secretary, are there particular behaviours that we should be taking a lead on in a, actively engaging with the general population uh, to try and reduce the possibility of their re engaging with old behaviours that are not very helpful? For the climate change agenda, we've talked about the positive benefits of uh, uh, of walking and cycling and so on and so forth, and that, that that that's great. But are we because people could become established in a new norm or resume the old norm? How are we going to help individuals, as distinct from bodies more generally, to uh, sustain some of the good habits they may have acquired? Um. I'm not sure there's an easy answer to that question. And it, can I just say that I was listening when Stuart was, Stephen was talking, Stevenson was talking there about. I mean, I, I think we have to be careful not to um, uh, go from um, uh, government action and then everything else we talk about is the action of individuals, because obviously, obviously, individuals make their own decisions um, about their behavioural practices on the basis of what is most them what, what they can and cannot do. And you know, Stuart Stevenson will know as I very rural area, um, some of your transport um, decisions are kind of made for you by other people and and um uh, and you know that's that's just something that, that is a reality. Um, so I wouldn't want to um, presume that when we're talking about behaviour we're only talking about individuals' behaviour. We are also talking about the behaviour of um, for example, um, uh, um, companies and uh, employers who have now got um, uh, a real-time uh, um, experiment ongoing about the capacity to increase the amount of um, remote working um, that 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 is feasible and possible. Um, that uh, uh, forced on them by 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 this current situation. But nevertheless, a learning experience um, at their level um, about what is and is not achievable. And I would hope that that's a kind of behaviour be able to, if not on the kind of full time basis that people are having to do it at the moment, at the very least on a much more flexible working basis than, than might otherwise have been um, regarded by a company. As being something that uh, um, they they wanted to allow for. So, um, when we talk about behaviours, uh, I'm I'm careful that we don't just talk about the behaviour of an individual who will often have to make a decision on a specific, you know, aspect of what they're doing on the basis of other organisations. Um, both private and public have decided is 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 appropriate. Um, you know, sometimes the behavioural choice that's made isn't really much of a choice at all. Um, so I think we need to we need to um, we need to have that thought in mind. Um, and uh, uh, um, so so I think buying those specific areas of behaviour and the the kind of Sectoral basis in which we're actually are are the ones that we want to want to keep, but genuinely understanding what is a genuine choice and and what is a choice that is actually forced on people because those are two different things. Thank you, Angus McDonald has a supplementary on that line of questioning. Yes, <laughs> thanks. Um, can we are uh, following up on on the cabinet secretary's point of uh, behavioural change of companies? Um, I also had a, an excellent meeting on Friday with the uh, uh, Industrial Decarbonisation Research and Innovation Centre, or IDRIC as they're called, 
Um, now, uh, we had um, some good discussions, but one point that came up was uh, um, the need for behavioural change, obviously, uh, with companies rather than uh, as well as individuals, and the need for transformative innovation to achieve uh, industrial decarbonisation. Um, and uh, obviously, Grangemouth will be playing a big part in that uh, in my constituency. Now, um, I'm just curious uh, as to whether or not there has been any constructive a dialogue with Bayes on, on moving that forward, uh, notwithstanding the, the, the um, current uh, health crisis. Um, well, um, our, we have um, written again to um, the UK government on the back of the advice that we got for the Committee on Climate Change, um, uh, reminding uh, the UK the significant areas um, in which we really need to see um, movement um, from the level of Westminster, if Westminster, if 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 the UK as a whole is going to reach its 2050 target, and if Scotland is going to reach its 2045 target, and the um, uh, decarbonisation issue is um, precisely one of those areas where the, where we do require to see some significant movement on the part of the UK government. So I have um, uh, written again um, to uh, to the UK government um, on that basis. Um, as yet, um, I, I, I haven't seen um, a, a great deal, um, uh, and you know, I mean, obviously that is a conversation we continue to attempt to have. Okay, thanks. Um, we'll certainly watch that space. Thanks, convener. Thank you. Now coming to questions from Claudia Beamish. Thank you very much, convener. And uh, I'd like to um, move on to exploring reco um, recovery planning with you, Cabinet Secretary. Uh, but just um, before that, um, I, I noted something that I completely agree with you on about none of us know the answers, all the answers, and we just genuinely don't know. But in terms of accelerating action, you highlighted um, the, the possibility that people will want to use private cars, understandably, after COVID, and I wondered whether that might be an opportunity for um, accelerating uh, the possibilities of electric and low emission um, private cars, um, just as a, as a specific thing to highlight to you. Um, I'm sure that my colleague Michael Matheson will already be um, uh, looking at what we can do um, in a Scottish context, but of course, um, there are significant uh, areas that the UK government could help in um, as well, uh, if that was to be uh, if that was to be considered an appropriate um, way to go. I, I see from uh, some of the reports that there are um, there are other countries beginning to increase the, um, support mechanisms for people buying um, ultra low electric vehicles, so ultra low emission vehicles. So um, clearly, other countries are also um, looking at this possibility, um, uh, but, but but there is still, you know, and that that is that is an important thing. We want people to make that switch, but that doesn't remove the challenge there is about mass public transportation. <laughs> it 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 changes the nature of the car that is bought, but it doesn't it doesn't it doesn't answer our concerns and questions about willingness to re-engage with uh, mass public transport. No, absolutely, I completely agree with you, and um, and it doesn't um, solve the issues around uh, congestion either. Although other as aspects of COVID um, uh, mm. learning lessons, like such as some degree of home working or whatever, um, I'm I'm keen to look more widely with you, Cabinet Secretary, um, about um, recovery planning, and um, I wonder if you could share with us some. Um, how um, across Scottish government there, there's some um, uh, what what sort of processes are in place for ensuring that we do deliver a green recovery um, and uh, as as we go forward with with our economy and society. Well, the green recovery um, is being uh, progressed through all existing work streams, um, and that includes the early action on economic recovery that, that um, is being discussed. Um, so, you know, we're trying because we know that the, we would describe as a new normal. Um, we are 
obviously wanting to develop plans for a green recovery now. Um, and uh, um, a, a big part of that is obviously building towards the publication of the refocused um, climate date in December. Um, work has has begun on that, and that will be a key strategic document for the green recovery, um, uh, as well as, as existing in and of itself, um, as uh, uh, as showing the pathway towards the 2030 um, uh, target. So um, I'm working very hard with cabinet and cabinet colleagues to ensure a joined up approach to sustainable recovery. Um, we do have a um, economy subcommittee um, at cabinet level, um, which you know, you know, this is a this is a weekly com um, and uh, we're trying to coordinate that uh, conversation and understanding um, across uh, government, across its agencies, across all sectors and local authorities. Um, so um, all contributions to that conversation. Um, are very much welcome. Right, and that, of course, some, as Claudia yeah. knows, that we have, I have sorry, as Claudia Beamish knows, we have reconvened um, and slightly rejigged um, working group um, that had been in place. So we've we've rejigged it to um, to attempt to account for the change in circumstances that we are um, uh, we are facing. So that group has already met once, and I think the next meeting is next week. Right. Uh, thank you, Cabinet Secretary. I was actually going to ask you about the coordination of um, green recovery across government with its agencies, and um, you know, not least um, High and South Scotland, as well as the as Enterprise, and also the um, and the the new Scottish National Investment Bank, um, which obviously has a, a low carbon commitment. Um, and, and public authorities, could you tell us a little bit more about how how that um, those connections are are working in the present circumstances of of Zoom and everything else that we have to? <laughs> well, we are um, we're trying to establish um, uh, a, a way for it to be done um, without everybody having to constantly be in various versions of the same Zoom meeting. Um, uh, so I have had a uh, conversation with um, uh, Benny Higgins and uh, some other recovery group, um, and I had another conversation with him this week. I've had um, uh, um, discussions with uh, people from the um, investment bank. We're talking to them about how they can um, be more directly connected to the sustainable uh, recovery group. Um, the, the Claudia is herself on now, um, so we are we are we are trying to have these conversations, and it's it's trying to ensure that what we don't do is simply replicate everybody's Zoom meetings in in slightly different uh, formatting, um, but make sure that there is an effective um, uh, um, network in place, and that's that's what we're currently doing. So I, I hope Claudia is uh, reassured by the fact that. Uh, you know, I'm about to have my second discussion with the Economic Recover Recovery Group um, chair. Um, uh, uh, we're actively um, looking at the the way the investment bank can link uh, uh, um, directly to um, the uh, the work that uh, my cross party group does. Because if you think about it, and the investment bank's fundamental purpose is to you know is is working towards that net zero um, by 2045. So it's really important that they are part of this as well, and not seen as just being completely separate and, and sitting on their own. So we are we are trying to ensure that this conversation works as well as it can, without, as I said, just ending up crashing everybody's system by by you know um, replicated Zoom meetings um, uh, all over the place. It's 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 not easy so in circumstances where. For obviously, for big sections of the economy, there's a very um, particular and critical need for um, for support and thinking. Right. Thank you. And just uh, finally, from myself, Cabinet Secretary, uh, just specifically, um, how engagement is being taken forward and will be taken forward actually with the Scottish Parliament itself. Thank you. Well, I mean, 
Um, obviously, we will engage with the committee. This is part of that engagement. Uh, the group that um, I set up has um, uh, party spokespeople on it for a, for a very good reason to ensure um, that the party spokespeople are able to um, uh, advise their own parties about what you know, you know what what is what is being um, uh, thought about, um, and uh, um, so that's that's already happening. Um, and uh, um, I'm not sure, uh, other than uh, um, the questions that I get asked in the chamber at present, uh, uh, um, or, or what is planned. There, there will, of course, be. Um, uh, um, there's a publication tomorrow morning at 9:30 of the greenhouse gas emission stats. So I'm doing, uh, I will be doing a statement on that tomorrow. And although that's not, um, that's a, um, it, rather sus suspecting that a lot of the questioning will probably be about economic recovery rather than than than, than the stats themselves. So th there will continue to be um, these opportunities. Thank you very much. All right, if we can move on to questions from Mark Ruskell, please. Thanks. Um, I was listening to what you were saying earlier uh, about uh, the kind of behavioural choices that, that people are, are able to make or sometimes unable to make. And I guess a lot of that comes down to the kind of systems and the infrastructure that, that we have around. Them. I wanted to ask you about the, the capital programme, the capital infrastructure. Uh, and the infrastructure investment program. The the infrastructure commission uh, last year was pretty clear in saying that we should be maintaining the infrastructure that we've got. We shouldn't be building new infrastructure that locks in emissions for the long term. So I'm just wondering what thinking is happening in the cabinet at the moment about reviewing some of those capital programs. Um, I mean, you'll be aware, of course, of the controversy around the Cross Tail Link Road. Um, Sheriff Roundabout, um, the A96. So, you know, some of these projects may have more or less economic advantage, other social benefits, but they all have an environmental cost and they all lock in emissions. So I'm just wondering where government is is at on that, whether the major rethink uh, of these capital projects or, or whether we're trundling on as we have done. Well, there's considerable discussion um, on infrastructure um, uh, uh, projects. That's um, uh, uh, being discussed um, uh, fairly frequently. Um, the, the, the the capital projects um, are are going to be seen as pretty funding the recovery. Um, uh, there is um, a desire um, not to have them uh, uh, lock in. Um, uh, um, uh, bad behaviours or bad, um, uh, uh, you know, bad. Um, perhaps bad's not the right word. You know, our, our changed view of what may be required. Um, but, but uh, I mean, obviously, um, decisions are having to be made um, very quickly um, because um, the, the, you know, the, the economy needs to be. Um, stood up as quickly as possible. Um, so th that conversation is 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 constant, um, and uh, um, I, you know, I, I don't want to tread on the toes of some of my colleagues who's who's uh, who have important um, roles here, um, the infrastructure secretary, but also the finance secretary, um, and um, I mean clearly. There will be uh, and have been announcements already, and there will continue to be um, announcements about various aspects of that. But suffice to say that there has been a, a kind of real look right across um, government for um, uh, for for potential um, uh, investment um, and where that would fit into um, our broader our broader desire for that green economic recovery. And is that a conversation that that um, government is having with individual councils at the moment, and as part of city deal partnerships as well? Because um, I guess every council now is looking at their own capital program and thinking about whether 
perhaps they should be investing in school infrastructure rather than road infrastructure or road maintenance. So I, I'm wondering to what extent the government is really having those active discussions with local authority partners about their own capital programmes. Well, you would probably need to speak to um, individual cabinet secretaries um, uh, who may have within their portfolios um, some of the kinds of capital projects that you're you're discussing, the extent to which um, uh, um, they are ongoing. I, I would be uh, astonished if all of that conversation was not uh, constant and current. Um, and um, I'm pretty sure that local authorities um, uh, would be uh, knocking on doors, which uh, um, uh, if they thought those doors were not open, then, but as far as I'm aware, those doors are all open. I mean, I, I'm not um, directly involved in those sorts of conversations, as the member probably is aware. Um, so I don't want to be uh, uh, saying um, uh, what is or is not happening. But all I can do is tell you that the conversations are happening constantly and frequently um, across uh, all portfolios um, right now, um, because we are all of us extremely concerned to try and establish um, the best way out of this um, um, this crisis that we're in. I'm going to move on to questions from Annie Wells. We're running out of time, so I'll make it a brief question, and hopefully. From the answers the, the, from the Cabinet Secretary previous, I'll probably get the answer quite quickly. But it was regarding housing retrofits and building new homes that are fit for the future. We know that this would have a direct social benefit of more comfortable homes and improved wellbeing and health. And these retrofits can improve, um, can be used to improve carbon and water efficiency. So we just ask the Cabinet Secretary if there have been any discussions with um, the Minister for Housing on this particular matter. The Minister for Housing is pretty much um, uh, 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 looking at all aspects of, of housing in respect to this. Retrofit um, has been a consistent part of the conversation um, uh, for many years, um, and um, Annie Wells will know um, uh, from her own experience that um, retrofit um, works better with some existing housing than it does with others. Um, so it really is um, a question of establishing um, where and in what way one could get um, rapid benefit from it. Um, there are some real challenges with retrofit, um, uh, but uh, where uh, where possible, um, where it is possible, I'm absolutely certain that Kevin Stewart will be looking closely at it. Thank you, Cabinet Secretary. Thank you, Convener. Okay, thank you. So we have time for one very short question from Finlay Carson, and then we'll have to let the Cabinet Secretary go. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Convener. Uh, last week we had uh, a very helpful uh, discussion with Chris Stark from the CCC, uh, and we touched on a Scottish office um, a base for, for the CCC. Um, we know the it. It currently gives exemplary uh, independent advice on low carbon economy and so on. And, and Chris Stark did say that there would be an advantage to a Scottish office uh, on climate change uh, to give advice to, to the Scottish Parliament and the Scottish Government. And I understand that uh, that the, the current funding is based on a population basis, uh, and the, the cost of a new office in the region of, of half a million pounds would be greater than the Scottish Government's contribution at the moment. But does the, the cabinet secretary think the value of having a, a Scottish office climate change uh, a, is, is, is worthwhile? And, and would the Scottish government look at potentially funding that in the future? Well, I've, I've publicly said that we would welcome um, a, a, a Scottish office of the Committee on Climate Change in Scotland. Um, we are discussing with the UK government how best this might be achieved. Okay. Thank you very much. I'd like to thank the Cabinet Secretary for all her time this morning and to her officials who've joined us throughout. Um, I'm going to move on to the next agenda item now. And that's uh, the fourth item today is a consideration of two negative instruments. That's the Freedom of Information Scotland Act 2002, Scottish Public Authorities Amendment Order 2020, 
and the Marine Works and Marine Licensing Miscellaneous Temporary Modifications for Coronavirus Scotland Regulations 2020. Now, I would like to ask members if they have any comments um, that they want to make in relation to these uh, instruments, if they would just put an R in the chat box. And I'm seeing a few of them arrive, and I'll come to people in turn. If I can come to Stuart Stevenson first. Uh, uh, thank you very much, uh, Kimbina. It, it, it's just a very a, a simple uh, thing to have a look at. Uh, in looking at the briefing, uh, one of the things the instrument on marine is doing is removing the need for a pre-application consultation event at a suitably accessible uh, venue. Um, and I, I absolutely understand why that should happen. However, I would quite like uh, uh, to know that such opportunities as might exist for using online consultations and events um, will be used to the extent as possible, recognising, of course, um, that not everyone has the equipment at home to enable them to participate, as they might do if they went out to a meeting. But I would, I would hate this to simply remove in totality um, the, 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 the proper process of engaging with local communities. And I think it might be useful uh, to write to the government in that regard. But I'm supporting um, this particular uh, SI, SSI nonetheless. Thank you, Stuart. And I'll come to Mark Ruskell. Thanks. Yeah, I had similar um, points, really, convener. I mean, I think. Pre-application consultations, exhibitions within communities, I think, are really important. Um, I'd like to think that as we move out of lockdown and we go through the different stages, uh, that it would be possible to hold an exhibition. It might need to be done under a socially distanced way, but I think a physical exhibition, you know, does make sense, particularly for communities that are that are connected to projects. So, um, yeah, I think some clarity from the government. See, this SI was perhaps written. At a time when we were very much in lockdown, as we come out of lockdown, you know, we'd like to see developers try and do exhibitions. Obviously, if they can't, then it has to go online. And probably having online alongside physical exhibitions would make sense anyway. But but I would like that, to see that option where possible. And I think getting clarity from government as to what industries' uh, intentions are on that would be really good. Thank you, Mark. And I'll come to Finlay Carson. Uh, thank you, Convener. Uh, I echo the concerns of my colleagues. Uh, the potential for impact of marine uh, engineering or whatever, whether it might be wind farms or, or, or fish farms or whatever, have a, a major impact in the communities uh, which are, are nearby. I, I'm concerned that there's any reduction in the ability for the public with the planning process. Uh, so a bit like Mark, I'd like uh, some more information on what the government can do to ensure that uh, any work that potentially has long-term effect on communities, uh, that that information is out there and we don't have any less scrutiny, scrutiny or ability for the public to, to engage. Thank you, colleagues, and I, I share your concerns. And I'd just like to ask if um, you confirm that you would like the committee to write to the government, putting forward your concerns around that and asking for clarity on what kind of public engagement is going to take place, either in place of a public a public kind of sphere, as in like a physical um, sphere, or whether or not, as we've moved through on through the phases, whether that's going to be reconsidered. But we can discuss that in private session. Are you content for me to and the clerks to draft something and to sign off on that? You are looking like you are. Thank you very much. Thank you, colleagues. That concludes the committee's business in public today. Our next meeting on the 23rd of June, we're going to be discussing our work programme in private. And as this is the committee's last public meeting before the recess, um, I'd like to extend a very hearty thank you uh, to all of those who have given evidence to the committee, all of uh, which has helped the committee's scrutiny of the Scottish Government's work, both before this lockdown period and throughout the year. 
And on behalf of my committee colleagues, I'd especially like to thank those who've given evidence during this particularly challenging time, and to our colleagues across the Parliament who have enabled us to hold committee meetings at this time, and I would say rather successfully, given that we have managed to do a stage two, and we've had a number of uh, with a number of pieces of legislation come through as well. I think it's worked very well. I'd like to extend that particularly to our committee clerks who've worked extraordinarily hard and to the Parliament's broadcasting team who've worked very hard to ensure that we can continue to work efficiently, albeit remotely. So we're now going to move on to private session and I end this meeting. Thank you all.